Section 18 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mausel's Chess Player by Edgar Allan Poe Perhaps no exhibition of the kind has ever elicited so general attention as the chess player of Mausel. Wherever seen, it has been an object of intense curiosity to all persons who think. Yet the question of its modus operandi is still undetermined. Nothing has been written on this topic which can be considered as decisive, and accordingly we find everywhere men of mechanical genius, of great general acuteness, and discriminative understanding, who make no scruple in pronouncing the automaton a pure machine. Unconnected with human agency in its movements, and consequently beyond all comparison the most astonishing of the inventions of mankind and such it would undoubtedly be were they right in their supposition assuming this hypothesis it would be grossly absurd to compare with the chess player any similar thing of either modern or ancient days yet there have been many and wonderful automata in brewster's letters on natural magic we have an account of the most remarkable among these may be mentioned as having beyond doubt existed firstly the coach invented by m camus for the amusement of louis the fourteenth when a child a table about four feet square was introduced into the room appropriated for the exhibition upon this table was placed a carriage six inches in length made of wood and drawn by two horses of the same material one window being down a lady was seen on the back seat a coachman held the reins on the box and a footman and page were in their places behind. M. Camus now touched a spring, whereupon the coachman smacked his whip, and the horses proceeded in a natural manner along the edge of the table, drawing after them the carriage. Having gone as far as possible in this direction, a sudden turn was made to the left, and the vehicle was driven at right angles to its former course and still closely along the edge of the table in this way the coach proceeded until it arrived opposite the chair of the young prince it then stopped the page descended and opened the door the lady alighted and presented a petition to her sovereign she then re-entered the page put up the steps closed the door and resumed his station the coachman whipped his horses and the carriage was driven back to its original position the magician of m maladet is also worthy of notice we copy the following account of it from the letters before mentioned of dr b who derived his information principally from the edinburgh encyclopedia one of the most popular pieces of mechanism which we have seen is the magician constructed by m maladet for the purpose of answering certain questions a figure dressed like a magician appears seated at the bottom of a wall holding a wand in one hand and a book in the other a number of questions ready prepared are inscribed on oval medallions and the spectator takes any one of these he chooses and to which he wishes an answer and having placed it in a drawer ready to receive it the drawer shuts with a spring till the answer is returned the magician then arises from his seat bows his head 
described circles with his wand and consulting the book as if in deep thought he lifts it towards his face having thus appeared to ponder over the proposed question he raises his wand and striking with it the wall above his head two folding doors fly open and display an appropriate answer to the question the doors again close the magician resumes his original position and the drawer opens to return the medallion there are twenty of these medallions all containing different questions to which the magician returns the most suitable and striking answers the medallions are thin plates of brass of an elliptical form exactly resembling each other some of the medallions have a question inscribed on each side both of which the magician answered in succession if the drawer is shut without a medallion being put into it the magician rises consults his book shakes his head and resumes his seat the folding doors remain shut and the drawer is returned empty if two medallions are put into the drawer together an answer is returned only to the lower one when the machinery is wound up the movements continue about an hour during which time about fifty questions may be answered the inventor stated that the means by which the different medallions acted upon the machinery so as to produce the proper answers to the questions which they contained were extremely simple the duck of vaucanson was still more remarkable it was of the size of life and so perfect an imitation of the living animal that all the spectators were deceived it executed says brewster all the natural movements and gestures it ate and drank with avidity performed all the quick motions of the head and throat which are peculiar to the duck and like it muddled the water which it drank with its bill it produced also the sound of quacking in the most natural manner in the anatomical structure the artist exhibited the highest skill every bone in the real duck had its representative in the automaton and its wings were anatomically exact every cavity apophysis and curvature was imitated and each bone executed its proper movements when corn was thrown down before it the duck stretched out its neck to pick it up swallowed and digested it but if these machines were ingenious what shall we think of the calculating machines of mr babbage what shall we think of an engine of wood and metal which can not only compute astronomical and navigational tables to any given extent but render the exactitude of its operations mathematically certain through its power of correcting its possible errors what shall we think of a machine which can not only accomplish all this but actually print off its elaborate results when obtained without the slightest intervention of the intellect of man it will perhaps be said in reply that such a machine as we have described is altogether above comparison with the chess player of Mausel. by no means it is altogether beneath it that is to say provided we assume what should never for a moment be assumed that the chess player is a pure machine and performs its operations without any immediate human agency arithmetical or algebraical calculations are from their very nature fixed and determinate certain data being given certain results necessarily and inevitably follow these results have dependence upon nothing and are influenced by nothing but the data originally given and the question to be solved proceeds or should proceed to its final determination by a succession of unerring steps liable to no change and subject to no modification 
this being the case we can without difficulty conceive the possibility of so arranging a piece of mechanism that upon a starting in accordance with the data of the question to be solved it should continue its movements regularly progressively and undeviatingly towards the required solution since these movements however complex are never imagined to be otherwise than finite and determinate but the case is widely different with the chess player with him there is no determinate progression no one move in chess necessarily follows upon any one other from no particular disposition of the men at one period of a game can we predicate their disposition at a different period let us place the first move in a game of chess in juxtaposition with the data of an algebraical question and their great difference will be immediately perceived from the latter from the data the second step of the question dependent thereupon inevitably follows it is modelled by the data it must be thus and not otherwise but from the first move in the game of chess no especial second move follows of necessity in the algebraical question as it proceeds toward solution the certainty of its operations remains altogether unimpaired the second step having been a consequence of the data the third step is equally a consequence of the second the fourth of the third the fifth of the fourth and so on and not possibly otherwise to the end but in proportion to the progress made in a game of chess is the uncertainty of each ensuing move a few moves having been made no step is certain different spectators of the game would advise different moves all is then dependent upon the variable judgment of the players now even granting what should not be granted that the movements of the automaton chess player were in themselves determinate they would be necessarily interrupted and disarranged by the indeterminate will of his antagonist there is then no analogy whatever between the operations of the chess player and those of the calculating machine of mr babbage and if we choose to call the former a pure machine we must be prepared to admit that it is beyond all comparison the most wonderful of the inventions of mankind its original projector however baron keplin had no scruple in declaring it to be a very ordinary piece of mechanism a bagatelle whose effects appeared so marvellous only from the boldness of the conception and the fortunate choice of the methods adopted for promoting the illusion but it is needless to dwell upon this point it is quite certain that the operations of the automaton are regulated by mind and by nothing else indeed this matter is susceptible of a mathematical demonstration a priori the only question then is of the manner in which human agency is brought to bear before entering upon this subject it would be as well to give a brief history and description of the chess player for the benefit of such of our readers as may never have had an opportunity of witnessing mr malzell's exhibition the automaton chess player was invented in seventeen sixty nine by baron keplin a nobleman of pressburg in hungary who afterwards disposed of it together with the secret of its operations to its present possessor soon after its completion it was exhibited in pressburg paris vienna and other continental cities in seventeen eighty three and seventeen eighty four it was taken to london by mr Mousel. of late years it has visited the principal towns in the united states wherever seen the most intense curiosity was excited by its appearance and numerous have been the attempts by men of all classes to fathom the mystery of its evolutions 
the cut on this page gives a tolerable representation of the figure as seen by the citizens of richmond a few weeks ago the right arm however should lie more at length upon the box a chessboard should appear upon it and the cushion should not be seen while the pipe is held some immaterial alterations have been made in the costume of the player since it came into the position of mausel the plume for example was not originally worn at the hour appointed for exhibition a curtain is withdrawn or folding doors are thrown open and the machine rolled to within about twelve feet of the nearest of the spectators between whom and it the machine a rope is stretched a figure is seen habited as a Turk, and seated with its legs crossed at a large box, apparently of maple wood, which serves it as a table. The exhibitor will, if requested, roll the machine to any portion of the room, suffer it to remain altogether on any designated spot, or even shift its location repeatedly during the progress of a game. The bottom of the box is elevated considerably above the floor by means of the casters or brazen rollers on which it moves, a clear view of the surface immediately beneath the automaton being thus afforded to the spectators. The chair on which the figure sits is affixed permanently to the box. On top of this latter is a chessboard also permanently affixed. The right arm of the chess player is extended at full length before him at right angles with his body and lying in an apparently careless position by the side of the board. The back of the hand is upwards. The board itself is eighteen inches square. The left arm of the figure is bent at the elbow and in the left hand is a pipe. A green drapery conceals the back of the Turk and falls partially over the front of both shoulders. To judge from the external appearance of the box, it is divided into five compartments, three cupboards of equal dimensions, and two drawers occupying that portion of the chest lying beneath the cupboards. The foregoing observations apply to the appearance of the automaton upon its first introduction into the presence of the spectators. Mausel now informs the company that he will disclose to their view the mechanism of the machine. Taking from his pocket a bunch of keys, he unlocks with them door marked one in the cut above and throws the cupboard fully open to the inspection of all present. Its whole interior is apparently filled with wheels, pinions, levers, and other machinery crowded very closely together so that the eye can penetrate but a little distance into the mass. Leaving this door open to its full extent, he goes now round to the back of the box and raising the drapery of the figure opens another door situated precisely in the rear of the one first opened holding a lighted candle at this door and shifting the position of the whole machine repeatedly at the same time a bright light is thrown entirely through the cupboard which is now clearly seen to be fully completely full of machinery the spectators being satisfied of this fact, Mazel closes the back door, locks it, takes the key from the lock, lets fall the drapery of the figure, and comes round to the front. The door mark one, it will be remembered, is still open. The exhibitor now proceeds to open the drawer which lies beneath the cupboards at the bottom of the box for although there are apparently two drawers there is really only one the two handles and two keyholes being intended merely for ornament having opened this drawer to its full extent a small cushion and a set of chessmen fixed in a framework made to support them perpendicularly are discovered Leaving this drawer, as well as cupboard number one open, Mausel now unlocks door number two and door number three, which are discovered to be folding doors, opening into one and the same compartment. 
to the right of this compartment however that is to say the spectator's right a small division six inches wide and filled with machinery is partitioned off the main compartment itself in speaking of that portion of the box visible upon opening doors two and three we shall always call it the main compartment is lined with dark cloth and contains no machinery whatever beyond two pieces of steel quadrant shaped and situated one in each of the rear top corners of the compartment a small protuberance about eight inches square and also covered with dark cloth lies on the floor of the compartment near the rear corner on the spectator's left hand leaving doors number two and number three open as well as the drawer and door number one the exhibitor now goes round to the back of the main compartment and unlocking another door there displays clearly all the interior of the main compartment by introducing a candle behind it and within it the whole box being thus apparently disclosed to the scrutiny of the company Malzel, still leaving the doors and drawers open rolls the automaton entirely round and exposes the back of the turk by lifting up the drapery a door about ten inches square is thrown open in the loins of the figure and a smaller one also in the left thigh the interior of the figure as seen through these apertures appears to be crowded with machinery in general every spectator is now thoroughly satisfied of having beheld and completely scrutinized at one and the same time every individual portion of the automaton and the idea of any person being concealed in the interior during so complete an exhibition of that interior if ever entertained is immediately dismissed as preposterous in the extreme monsieur mazel having rolled the machine back into its original position now informs the company that the automaton will play a game of chess with any one disposed to encounter him this challenge being accepted a small table is prepared for the antagonist and placed close by the rope but on the spectator's side of it and so situated as not to prevent the company from obtaining a full view of the automaton from a drawer in this table is taken a set of chessmen and mausel arranges them generally but not always with his own hands on the chessboard which consists merely of the usual number of squares painted upon the table the antagonist having taken his seat the exhibitor approaches the drawer of the box and takes therefrom the cushion which after removing the pipe from the hand of the automaton he places under its left arm as a support then taking also from the drawer the automaton set of chessmen he arranges them upon the chessboard before the figure he now proceeds to close the doors and to lock them leaving the bunch of keys in door number one he also closes the drawer and finally winds up the machine by applying a key to an aperture in the left end the spectator's left of the box the game now commences the automaton taking the first move the duration of the contest is usually limited to half an hour but if it be not finished at the expiration of this period and the antagonist still contend that he can beat the automaton m malsell has seldom any objection to continue it not to weary the company is the ostensible and no doubt the real object of the limitation it would of course be understood that when a move is made at his own table by the antagonist the corresponding move is made at the box of the automaton by mausel himself who then acts as the representative of the antagonist on the other hand when the turk moves the corresponding move is made at the table of the antagonist also by m mausel who then acts as the representative of the automaton in this manner it is necessary that the exhibitor should often pass from one table to the other 
he also frequently goes in rear of the figure to remove the chest men which it has taken and which it deposits when taken on the box to the left to its own left of the board when the automaton hesitates in relation to its move the exhibitor is occasionally seen to place himself very near its right side and to lay his hand now and then in a careless manner upon the box he has also a peculiar shuffle with his feet calculated to induce suspicion of collusion with the machine in minds which are more cunning than sagacious these peculiarities are no doubt mere mannerisms of monsieur mazel or if he is aware of them at all he puts them in practice with a view of exciting in the spectators a false idea of the pure mechanism in the automaton the turk plays with his left hand and all movements of the arm are at right angles in this manner the hand which is gloved and bent in a natural way being brought directly above the piece to be moved descends finally upon it the fingers receiving it in most cases without difficulty occasionally however when the piece is not precisely in its proper situation the ottoman fails in his attempt at seizing it when this occurs no second effort is made but the arm continues its movement in the direction originally intended precisely as if the piece were in the fingers having thus designated the spot whither the move should have been made the arm returns to its cushion and mazel performs the evolution which the automaton pointed out at every movement of the figure machinery is heard in motion during the progress of the game the figure now and then rolls its eyes as if surveying the board moves its head and pronounces the word check when necessary if a false move be made by his antagonist he raps briskly on the box with the fingers of his right hand shakes his head roughly and replacing the piece falsely moved in its former situation assumes the next move himself upon beating the game he waves his head with an air of triumph looks round complacently upon the spectators and drawing his left arm farther back than usual suffers his fingers alone to rest upon the cushion in general the turk is victorious once or twice he has been beaten the game being ended mauser will again if desired exhibit the mechanism of the box in the same manner as before the machine is then rolled back and a curtain hides it from the view of the company there have been many attempts at solving the mystery of the automaton the most general opinion in relation to it an opinion too not unfrequently adopted by men who should have known better was as we have before said that no immediate human agency was employed in other words that the machine was purely a machine and nothing else many however have maintained that the exhibitor himself regulated the movements of the figure by mechanical means operating through the feet of the box others again spoke confidently of a magnet of the first of these opinions we shall say nothing at present more than we have already said in relation to the second it is only necessary to repeat what we have before stated that the machine is rolled about on casters and will at the request of a spectator be moved to and fro to any portion of the room even during the progress of a game the supposition of the magnet is also untenable for if a magnet were the agent any other magnet in the pocket of a spectator would disarrange the entire mechanism the exhibitor however will suffer the most powerful lodestone to remain even upon the box during the whole of the exhibition the first attempt at a written explanation of the secret at least the first attempt of which we ourselves have any knowledge was made in a large pamphlet printed at paris in seventeen eighty five 
the author's hypothesis amounted to this that a dwarf actuated the machine this dwarf he supposed to conceal himself during the opening of the box by thrusting his legs into two hollow cylinders which were represented to be but which are not among the machinery in the cupboard number one while his body was out of the box entirely and covered by the drapery of the turk when the doors were shut the dwarf was enabled to bring his body within the box the noise produced by some portion of the machinery allowing him to do so unheard and also to close the door by which he entered the interior of the automaton being then exhibited and, and no person discovered the spectators says the author of this pamphlet are satisfied that no one is within any portion of the machine this whole hypothesis was too obviously absurd to require comment or refutation and accordingly we find that it attracted very little attention in seventeen eighty nine a book was published at dresden by m i f freyhere in which another endeavor was made to unravel the mystery mr freyhere's book was a pretty large one and copiously illustrated by colored engravings his supposition was that a well-taught boy very thin and tall of his age sufficiently so that he could be concealed in a drawer almost immediately under the chessboard played the game of chess and effected all the evolutions of the automaton this idea although even more silly than that of the parisian author met with a better reception and was in some measure believed to be the true solution of the wonder until the inventor put an end to the discussion by suffering a close examination of the top of the box these bizarre attempts at explanation were followed by others equally bizarre of late years however an anonymous writer by a course of reasoning exceedingly unphilosophical has contrived to blunder upon a plausible solution although we cannot consider it altogether the true one his essay was first published in a baltimore weekly paper was illustrated by cuts and was entitled an attempt to analyze the automaton chess player of m malzel this essay we suppose to have been the original of the pamphlet to which sir david brewster alludes in his letters on natural magic and which he has no hesitation in declaring a thorough and satisfactory explanation the result of the analysis are undoubtedly in the main just but we can only account for brewster's pronouncing the essay a thorough and satisfactory explanation by supposing him to have bestowed upon it a very cursory and inattentive perusal in the compendium of the essay made use of in the letters on natural magic it is quite impossible to arrive at any distinct conclusion in regard to the adequacy or inadequacy of the analysis on account of the gross misarrangement and deficiency of the letters of reference employed the same fault is to be found in the attempt etc as we originally saw it the solution consists in a series of minute explanations accompanied by woodcuts the whole occupying many pages in which the object is to show the possibility of so shifting the partitions of the box as to allow a human being concealed in the interior to move portions of his body from one part of the box to another during the exhibition of the mechanism thus eluding the scrutiny of the spectators there can be no doubt as we have before observed and as we will presently endeavour to show that the principle or rather the result of the solution is the true one some person is concealed in the box during the whole time of exhibiting the interior we object however to the whole verbose description of the manner in which the partitions are shifted to accommodate the movements of the person concealed we object to it as a mere theory assumed in the first place and to which circumstances are afterwards made to adapt themselves it was not and could not have been arrived at by any inductive reasoning in whatever way the shifting is managed it is of course concealed at every step from observation 
to show that certain movements might possibly be affected in a certain way is very far from showing that they are actually so effected there may be an infinity of other methods by which the same results may be obtained the probability of the one assumed proving the correct one is then as unity to infinity but in reality this particular point the shifting of the partitions is of no consequence whatever it was altogether unnecessary to devote seven or eight pages for the purpose of proving what no one in his senses would deny viz that the wonderful mechanical genius of baron keplin could invent the necessary means for shutting a door or slipping aside a panel with a human agent too at his service in actual contact with the panel or the door with the whole operations carried on as the author of the essay himself shows and as we shall attempt to show more fully hereafter entirely out of reach of the observation of the spectators in attempting ourselves an explanation of the automaton we will in the first place endeavour to show how its operations are effected and afterwards describe as briefly as possible the nature of the observations from which we have deduced our results End of section 18. Recording by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine.